I welcome you to this second in our Lyman Beecher Lectures. I am Nora Tubbs Tisdale. I teach preaching here at Yale Divinity School, and it gives me a great deal of joy today to have the opportunity to introduce to you my dear friend, Brian Blunt. I first got to know Brian Blunt when we joined the faculty at Princeton Theological Seminary the same year, 2003. We served together as colleagues on that faculty for eight years, and in the process, co-taught a course together on preaching the Gospel of Mark, and co-edited a book together on worship and multiculturalism. I will never forget the first few lectures I heard Brian Blunt give in that course on Mark. I approached him at the end of the second or third lecture and said, in these first two lectures alone, you have totally changed my view of this gospel. I had always sort of seen Mark to be the first but weaker synoptic gospel, <laughs> especially in terms of its depiction of a radical Jesus, and it seemed Luke to be the gospel with all the social justice stuff going for it. But Professor Blunt changed all of that for me presenting me with this unleashed, boundary-breaking, world-upending Jesus who upset all the social, religious, and political norms of his day and who met the inevitable death that comes to those who challenge the system at every turn. I have frankly never read the Gospel of Mark the same way again. <laughs> and if you want to be so transformed, get his book, Go Preach, Mark's Kingdom Gospel in the Black Church Today. I suspect, though, that those of you who were here for the first Beecher Lecture know what it is to have your world sort of inverted by Brian Blunt. <laughs> I walked in this morning and I said, well, look at this sea of zombies. <laughs> Brian Blunt and I also co-edited a book together on worship and multiculturalism. We mostly did so as we sat at either his or my kitchen tables in Princeton, New Jersey, and in the process, I had some of the most honest and helpful conversations I have ever had with anybody about race and culture and how they affect the way we relate to one another. I have long said that if that book didn't sell a single copy, it would have been worth it to me for the privilege of writing it with Brian Blunt. Brian Blunt is an extraordinary scholar, teacher, preacher, and leader. He has written or co-authored eight books, including one of my personal favorites, Preaching Mark in Two Voices, that he and his long-term friend Gary Charles wrote together, where they each took passages from Mark's gospel, interpreted in their very different contexts, and then preached them in their very different contexts so that you have these two contextual readings of Mark side by side in the same book. His latest book, not surprisingly, is a commentary on Revelation, which is world upending. Brian Blunt is also a gifted teacher who is much in demand not only in seminary classrooms, but in churches for adult education classes where he is excellent at taking serious biblical scholarship and making it accessible and relevant for lay people. He is a fabulous preacher. I'm sorry he's not preaching this week, but you get a flavor in the lectures. Because <laughs> he's frankly one of my very favorite contemporary preachers, whose lively, engaging, and challenging sermons are known to upend some worlds of their own. He is a visionary leader who has led my MDiv alma mater, Union Theological Seminary in Virginia, now known as Union Presbyterian Seminary, through some difficult and challenging years these past four years, as freestanding seminaries all over our nation have faced major financial challenges. And he has done so with grace and courage and an eye always toward the future. And Brian Blunt is also one of the finest human beings I know a person of integrity, courage, deep-seated faith and faithfulness who has been an inspiration to many people, including me. He is married to an equally wonderful and amazing human being, Sharon Blunt, who is here with us this week. And they are parents to two great children who we watched grow up in Princeton, New Jersey. Joshua, who graduates this year from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, 
and Kaylin, who is a high school senior, checking out schools, including Yale. So if any of you have any pull, use it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Brian and Sharon, it gives me a great deal of personal joy to welcome you here to my home these past five and a half years, Yale Divinity School, and we eagerly look forward to hearing your next lecture, Apocalyptic Vulnerability, Preaching Paul. Can I hear a round of applause for Brian Jack? Thank you so much, Norg. We have uh, been such wonderful friends and uh, have been able to watch each other's children grow up. So um, Leonora and Will, uh, Sharon and I have watched grow up and we've cherished uh, their careers as they've been growing as well. It's just wonderful to be able to be here uh, with um, her, particularly um, given the friendship we've established over these past years. But it has also been a pleasure to be with you to talk about um, some of the things that I have been working on and thinking about. Uh, Nora noticed something unusual about the lecture this morning. It's about Paul, and she said, I've never heard you uh, lecture on Paul. And I told her that's because I don't. Uh, this is, <laughs> this is uh, my first public lecture ever on Paul. I've done some in, in the introduction to New Testament, but other than that, uh, this is the first. I'm trying some things out on you all. Uh, Paul and I have a fascinating um, interaction. I really enjoy Paul at times, and at times, you know, I feel like I'm fighting with Paul. Um, but I have loved um, the engagement because Paul, as you know, is really philosophical in his theology and in his approach. And so what I wanted to do was to see whether or not some of the questions I was asking in that initial lecture can also apply when one looks at Paul. Uh, can one look through the resurrection lens first and foremost when um, on the surface it appears that Paul wants us to look through the cross first and foremost? So I wanted to ask that question. I also wanted to ask what it means for Paul to think about uh, resurrection as it relates to um, how we live our lives today and whether that sense of living deadness applies with him and whether he has a word to us out of that application. So those questions were in front of me. I want to work with some of the same themes, but since I'm working with Paul, it'll be a little bit different, so I want to try that out with you as we talk together um, this morning. Um, so it's um, an interesting journey to look at Paul with these same questions in mind. Popular television series debuted last year, The Walking Dead. Its premise is simple. A police officer or sheriff is wounded in the line of duty. Seriously injured, he slips into a coma. During his period of inca incapacitation, a ghastly pandemic breaks out in the world. An unspecified, rapidly contagious virus destroys the higher functions of the human brain and leaves a hollowed out, violent, attacking, corpse-like entity in its place. For all intents and purposes, persons infected by the disease are dead, and yet they are still animated, still in some sense alive. The series traces the exploits of the, medically speaking, resurrected sheriff and a small remnant of the uninfected as they try to escape both the walking dead and the virus that has created them. Theirs is a world that has been invaded, occupied, and terrorized by death. Death's utter defeat of their world appears imminent. Paul, according to Galatians 1, 11 through 24, has his own odd, one might even say, apocalyptic awakening. While the Galatians version contains none of the theophany-like experiences of blinding light and thundering voice narrated in Acts 9 and 22, the autobiographical report does suggest that some extra-human revelation forced itself upon Paul, compelling him to wake up and see the world and its place in it differently than he had before. It is not just that his cause takes a wild and fairly incomprehensible shift from persecution to promotion of the Christian faith. His understanding of God's actions in Christ reconfigures everything about his comprehension of the human historical era. Through his conversion experience, he has awakened to the realization that his world and the people who walk in it are infested by the virus of death. Paul clarifies our circumstance and God's response and invasion of the dead. God has invaded 
God will very soon vivify the dead, then they too will invade. Now, like John of Patmos, Paul is an apocalyptic thinker and writer. A brief and cursory appeal to citations from the apostles' letters makes the point dramatically. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17 not only showcases Paul's belief that Jesus' return is imminent within his lifetime, but that this precious moment will signal a rapturing of believers living and dead to meet Christ in the clouds. In our wonderful work, our mother, St. Paul, Beverly Roberts Gaventa, observes, quote, 1 Corinthians celebrates the coming destruction of all God's enemies, and Romans 8 pits God's power over against all the forces that attempt to separate humanity from God's love. The Philippians hymn anticipates the bowing of all creation in heaven and on earth and under the earth before the name of Jesus, unquote. As Richard Hayes notes, even Galatians, though it lacks reference to a specific apocalyptic scenario, must be understood as a letter fully as apocalyptic as are the other Paulines because it reveals the present as the time of the dawn of God's new creation. From the beginning of his apostolic mission to the end, Paul's thinking, teaching, writing, his very essence are steeped in apocalyptic eschatology. Indeed, as Gaventa writes in notices of Galatians 1, 11 through 12, Paul announces emphatically that the very gospel he preached came by means of an apocalypse. J. Christian Becker is therefore right to conclude that Paul's apocalyptic can neither be eliminated nor reinterpreted in such a way just to accommodate our tastes and sensibilities. But that does not mean that contemporary scholars and preachers do not, of course, try Gaventa argues that, quote, whatever Paul may have believed, contemporary Christians cannot find themselves in this cosmic apocalyptic battleground. The shadow of Rudolf Bultmann's insistence that the New Testament be demythologized lingers, unquote. We contemporary preachers are often more Bultmannian than we know. Perhaps in the end, we are also more Corinthian than we would like. Let me suggest why. A useful historical conversation revolves around Karl Barth's inspection of Paul in his classic little work, The Resurrection of the Dead. Allow me a moment to refresh us on the particulars of his points and the debate it generated. In the study of 1 Corinthians, Barth centers Paul's thought in chapter 15, where the focus is on the resurrection of the dead. Chapters 1 through 14 comprise the ethical mandate for Christian living. Paul lodges the apocalyptic imperative behind these ethical mandates in chapter 15. Correct Christian behavior is based upon a correct Christian understanding of the resurrection of the dead. If you don't understand the resurrection of the dead, you don't have a correct Christian understanding of how to live. Barth, though, starts to back away from this apocalyptic eschatology in his dialectical approach to biblical interpretation. He argues that while Paul is still indeed speaking of last things, the apostle does not mean the end of time as a literal termination of history, but the qualitative end, which marks all of time that precedes it. Not a literal end, but a qualitative end. Now, Rudolf Bultmann, reacting to Bart, argues that there is a literal apocalyptic language in 1 Corinthians 15, but he declares that's not really Paul's primary concern. It's there, but Paul really isn't concerned about it. Bultmann instead centers Paul's focus in chapter 13, where Paul is really using apocalyptic eschatology to give support to the letter's ethical mandates. Then for Bultmann, the climax of the letter must be in its ethical core, love. The central focus of chapter 13, by its juxtaposition with chapter 15, is shown to be the ultimate human possibility for human activity because love has become an eschatological event. And when you hear Paul preached in 1 Corinthians 15, that chapter 13, especially at weddings, just rings out over and over and over again. Love as the thing Paul is pushing and pushing and pushing. For the demythologizing Boltmann, And for many of us, the preaching of love is the resurrection of the dead. Now, Ernst Kazemann noticed that something like this dehistoricizing, demythologizing, and therefore delegitimizing had occurred centuries earlier in Corinth. The expectation of an imminently inbreaking reign was absent in Corinth. 
eschatological relationship with God, what we colloquially refer to as salvation, was instead for this Gentile community collapsed totally into the present, into the here and now. Not out there in the future, but in the here and now. The resurrection of the dead in its symbolic essence and qualitative impact had already taken place. The logical conclusion to such a line of thinking, any literal future resurrection of the dead and embarrassment in Corinth was discounted and denied. Remember Paul saying, already you are kings. You've got it all already, the resurrection of the dead included. This discounting, perhaps denial, but certainly downplaying of a literal future resurrection of the dead brings us back to dehistoricizing, demythologizing, remythologizing, and eventually us, mainstream and academic Christians. It's all about us. The apocalyptic focus on the cosmos and its literal end-time rehabilitation via a universal transformational dawn of the dead degenerates into a fixation on individual sin redemption. The concentration is less and less on God's future intervention and sovereignty and the urgency that God's future intervention places upon our efforts for present preparedness. Instead, we perceive our salvific state which in apocalyptic eschatology is out there in the future and only in God's sovereign purview to be more and more not only presently realizable, but in some tangible ways under our theological control. And so Becker argues that, quote, the imminent triumph of God in Christ is here translated into our human responsibility in Christ, unquote. And so we focus on correct doctrine, right belief and appropriate behavior because that is what saves us. And we judge others more harshly when their doctrines, beliefs, and behaviors differ too radically from our quote-unquote orthodox own. And such a moment having rendered impotent the silliness of a future intervention marked by a literal great getting up morning of all the dead, something only God can make happen, we are left with this qualitatively present, eschatologically realized sense that the end is no real end at all. Instead, the end becomes a qualitative marker of God's ultimacy that lives itself out here in the present as love and as the proclamation of the Christ kerygma. Becker sums it up well enough, quote, our prevalent way of overcoming the difficulty of Paul's apocalyptic seems to lie either in the solution of realized eschatology or in that of salvation history, unquote. For perhaps more sophisticated reasons and with admittedly better ethical results, we are as fervently non-apocalyptic as the Corinthians were. And so even as we, along with Paul, Bart, Boltmann, Kazamon, and the legion of New Testament scholars and preachers who follow in their wake, heap homiletic and academic derision down upon the Corinthians' aberrant, Greco-Romanized, pseudo-Christian lives, in those moments when we realize just how apocalyptic Paul was and just how apocalyptic we are not, we cannot help but usefully conclude that in the fullness of this ironic circle of faith, we are all of us Corinthians now. Which means that we, like the pre-conversion Paul and the post-conversion Corinthians, do not fully appreciate the magnitude of the mess we are in. Our homiletical task is to shake our congregations out of the slumber that makes the dream of the ultimate end-time prize seem like something they already hold in their present congregational and individual grasp. We have all heard the pious, self-righteous, it's all about me, Christian question, or some variant of it that wants to presume an affirmative answer. Are you saved? Are you saved? The right answer is always a universal negative. Nobody, absolutely nobody, is safe. Where the combat circumstance of the reign of God is concerned, there is no such thing as quality time, as if there is some essential, more important time that we spend with the one we love that makes up for all the literal, literal time where we find ourselves trying to make up for the time we ignored her. Where this present era is concerned, there is no linear, literal time where we find ourselves subjected to the powers that rule this age and an exceptional qualitative time where the faithful, the so-called saved, 
live beyond the reach of these powers. There is present time and there is future time. There is this age and there is God's age. In this age, it is time we wake up to the realization that we are living dead. That, in a colloquial nutshell, I think is also Paul's apocalyptic point. The living dead are us. And that's what I want to explore right now. I believe that Paul also operates from the mythological apocalyptic categories that I used yesterday when I was talking about John of Patmos, life, living, dead, type A, dead, and type B, dead, dead. I think Paul expands even upon all of that with death's characterization as an animate, personalized, anthropomorphized power. In Paul's letters, type A death, the reality that snuffs out human existence in this historical era is relative enough, fluid enough, that one can rise above it. Jesus certainly does. Jesus, as the first fruits of a broader harvest, is a prototype for a subsequent general resurrection. In this general end time raising, we will be constitutionally distinct from the existence we have before we experience type A death. As Mary Harris notes, when Paul speaks about a resurrection from the dead or of the dead, he is not talking about the revitalization of dead corpses. Quote, rather he has in mind the emergence of deceased persons from the realm of the dead in a transformed bodily state, unquote. As with Jesus, so with us, something materially different from what has existed in this historical era is raised up beyond type A death. Jesus' resurrection further demonstrates the complexity surrounding death for Paul. In Romans 6, 9, Paul indicates that Jesus will not only rise beyond death, but that because of this rising, death as a power, as an entity, will no longer have dominion over him. Death then is more than a phase of existence. It is also a superhuman force that uses type A death as a weapon even against Christ. Death uses death to exercise authority and control. For a time, even Christ was caught in death's snare. Even Christ died type A death. It is a death, according to Romans 6, 9 through 13, intimately connected with another animate, personalized, anthropomorphized power of this age that has captured human beings and battles God, sin. Having risen beyond type A death, according to Romans 6, 9 through 13, Christ will never die again. The implication is clear. There is a type B death that is final for Paul as well. The category opposite type B death is life. It is what Christ receives following his resurrection, direct eschatological relationship with God. Type B death as its opposite by definition is eschatological separation from God. In this historical realm, Christ was subject to the powers of sin and death. Christ died the type A death that sin and death wield in this age, but Christ was raised to life, eschatological relationship with God, and thus is forever beyond the orbit and control of type B death. No doubt sin and death's ultimate weapon. What mechanism did God use to destroy the grasp that death once wielded over Christ? I want to make the case that even for Paul, it is the weapon of resurrection. As I say, I know it's a harder case to work with because for Paul, the cross is what is preeminently, is what is preeminently displayed. Now, if Christ's situation is fairly clear, ours is fairly murky. We who occupy this historical era do not possess life since we do not have a direct eschatological relationship with God. Vulnerable to the influence of sin and death, like Christ, we die a type A death. Based on the fact that Christ's resurrection is billed as the first fruits of something broader to come after dying, type A, we have a promised resurrection opportunity for either life, Romans 2.7, or type B death, Romans 2.8. Type A death is fluid. We will move beyond it. It appears to be for all intents and purposes a way station, not a destination. We know then precisely where we are going. First, type A death, unless, of course, the general resurrection happens while we still exist in this historical era. And then, second, either life or type B death. What we do not fully appreciate is where we are now, I am suggesting. As I've suggested already, I think we're in the realm of the living dead. Our cosmic condition is characterized completely by death because it is ruled by the power of sin and death. 
Prior to Christ's resurrection, humans were so enslaved to sin and death that we were open to, vulnerable to, no other person or power, not even God. We were constitutionally of the dead and thus open only to the call of the dead. There was not even in this state any struggle. The living dead live out death easily and naturally because death is not only the power that rules over us, death is the circumstance of our existence, the ontological essence of our being. And thus death's voice is the only calling voice we can hear. We are slaves to death precisely because we are the living dead. Dead is who we are. Dying is what we do. The opposition in the pews will cry out, when God created humankind in Eden, God breathed life into the human being and thus made him and her alive. I do not contest the point. Paul explains, though, that in the expulsion from Eden, something more precious than a ground lease was lost. Humankind lost life. In the first humans trespass, all humans die, Romans 5, 12 through 21. Given Paul's declarations about the rule of sin and death in this age, it seems appropriate to conclude that Paul is not only talking about a future type A death, which is a natural part of living, but a metaphorical death akin to a type B death, eschatological separation from God that is experientially real in our present. Paul uses the language of enslavement to describe it, so Gaventa, quote, Paul needs the relentless argument of Romans 1, 18 through 3.20 in order to show the depth of human oppression by superhuman powers, unquote. Slaves to sin and death. We are locked into this grisly cosmic condition. To paraphrase the apostle with what I think is more precise grammar, given the preponderance of aorist verbs connected with human death and dying in this important section, and Adam... We all died. Ours is an animated living death. We are all of us, even us Christian us, dead people walking. Does this recognition not help explain why we consume each other in our world the way we do? Does it not help us understand why we are often so vicious with one another on both individual and communal levels? Does it not help us realize why we feel so caught off guard when someone does something truly magnanimous and sacrificial on behalf of someone else, particularly when it is someone unknown? We are dead. It should not be surprising that we act in such deadly ways. To use the popular cultural symbolism of the walking dead, Adam's trespass set off a pathogenic viral release that went immediately global. More than global, it went cosmic. The key apocalyptic point for Paul is now this. Because of Adam's trespass and the virus it released, the cosmos has been taken captive by anti-God powers. Paul graphically depicts the gravity of the situation in Romans chapters 5 through 8, a section that in Gaventa's words, quote, teems with the language of conflict, unquote. The imagery is that of weapons, enemies, prisoners of war, and the doubt that there can ever be peace and reconciliation between warring parties. It sounds like our world as well. Gaventa's conclusion is striking, quote, infected, that's my word, she doesn't use that word, infected, now her, humanity, actually belongs to sin and its partner death as its slaves, as citizens of territory occupied by these ruling powers, and here's the key, as weapons in its hands, and thus even as enemies of God. We become, as the living dead, weapons of sin and death used against God. What Paul is trying to get across. Every effort humankind made to check the gruesome contagion responsible for this cataclysmic circumstance where humans become dead automatons striking out even against their creator only made the situation worse. Paul labels the pathogen that Adam's actions release sin. A hundred percent of the time, infection by sin leads to death. Not just type A death, but death of a B type that occurs even while one continues to exist in this historical era. Sin takes up residence and metastasizes in human flesh, not to be equated with our biological tissue, but the physical essence, the metaphorical bodily stuff of our humanity. 
and warps it and disfigures it until it is, we are, inhuman, grotesque caricatures of the uninfected bodily entities we were intended to be. This is the condition I want to describe as living death, which of course renders humankind the living dead. Unchecked, this virus does not cease its destructive capacity when a human experiences type A death. This virus does not die, at least not in this age. Though the physical body dies, the pathogen and its impact live on, resurrecting the virus, resurrecting with the raised person and ultimately bringing on the devastating, annihilating type B death. You can't even die and get away from sin. For such a person, there will be a great getting up morning, but the party will not last. Given this kind of destructive scenario of apocalyptic proportions, it is no wonder that humans sought out an antidote. Paul labels it the law. A gift to the people of Israel by God, the law was intended to assist God's people in adhering to God's expectations for life. But Paul appeals to a forensic argument about the law in order to show that it leads to hopelessness. He goes into the courtroom language. The law cannot deliver. This is because the living dead, enslaved to death by sin, did not have the facility to capitalize on the law. Sin captured and twisted the intended antidote until it became more harmful than useful. It pointed out just how dead humankind was to God's expectations for life, but it did not provide humankind with the power to overcome that deadness. The law then, like a malformed vaccine, ended up worsening the condition of human deadness, reinforcing it rather than curing it. Through the law, sin thus trapped humankind into this living death. What Paul, formerly a champion of the law, wakes up to is the realization that there is no miracle cure, no potion, no vaccine that can check the power of sin and therefore overcome human enslavement to death. And this is how humans become locked into the condition of the living dead. One cannot, as humans found out with the failed law experiment, treat this sin dead in existence with medicinal research, litigate it through forensic skill, or overcome it by providing a perfect human whose ethics other humans may be exhorted to emulate. The situation is that of an occupation by a foreign power whose viral rule is a product of our own human Adamic failing. We dwell in a land of the living dead. We too are the living dead. We are in the dark here. Help must come from the outside. Someone must invade, which of course brings us to God and brings us back to resurrection. Ernst Kazemann made the case that the transforming intervention was built around the expectation of an imminent parousia, a second coming of Christ. Chris Becker reaffirmed that God's pivotal invasion is Christ's second coming and the resurrection of the dead that comes with it. While Martin C. de Boer argues that Paul emphasizes Christ's parousia, he also believes that there is something more. He writes, quote, Paul's apocalyptic language not only to the end and to the parousia, applies not only to the end and to the parousia, but also to the gospel he now proclaims and the faith it creates. Paul isn't just applying it to the end time, he's applying it now. The gospel and faith, which take their point of departure from Christ's death and resurrection, are also part and parcel of Paul's apocalyptic eschatology. J. Lewis Martin pioneered this line of discussion. Working from Galatians 1.4, he recognized an apocalyptic, revelatory shifting of the ages, from enslavement to the powers of sin and death to freedom from those powers that occurred with Christ's death. In this way, the cross is as purely apocalyptic as revelatory of God's end-time goal for humankind as is the coming parousia. In other words, these authors are making the case that God's apocalyptic weapon appears to be the cross. Now hold on because I'm going to suggest in just a second that I think it can be viewed otherwise, his apocalyptic weapon. One could certainly get the impression that the cross is the apocalyptic weapon from the impression Paul gives us from his own comments and the conclusive remarks of his many interpreters. At 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul argues that Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, rescues us from wrath that God directs towards sin and death and those enslaved to those powers. 
But the emphasis on the resurrection as a principal invasive act retreats when Paul declares definitively in Romans 5, 9 through 10 that God moves decisively through the blood and death of Jesus on the cross. Indeed, at 1 Corinthians 2, 2, Paul emphasizes this crucifixion focus. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Becker advises that focusing on letters like Galatians and 2 Corinthians that are oriented primarily around the death of Christ, scholars from Augustine to Luther, Calvin, Barton, Bultmann have proposed so narrow a focus on on Golgotha that he can call their thinking, quote, an exclusivistic theology of the cross in Paul, unquote. Indeed, Gaventa observes that it is the crucifixion, not the resurrection, that occupies center stage in the all-important Galatians correspondence. Quote, do Paul's references to the cross carry an implicit reference to resurrection as well, as is sometimes suggested? The answer to that question, at least in Galatians, must surely be no, unquote. Lou Martin, citing especially 1, 3 through 4 in Galatians, appeals to Paul's fight in Galatia with Gnostic enthusiasts who championed a superlative spiritual sensibility. They claim no longer to live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Paul, working from God's invasive maneuver of the cross, insists that the transformation is not one of living in this era according to some spiritual enthusiasm, but living in this world according to the cross. It is through the cross, then, that we are snatched out of the grasp of the powers of this present evil age. The cross becomes the turning point in the war between the ages. Because of the cross, as Martin points out, the marks of the new age are present and hidden in the old age. From this Galatian starting point, Gaventa widens the cross's field of operation throughout Paul's letters. Building from Romans 3 and Romans 8, she argues that Paul, quote, explicitly identifies God's offering up of Jesus Christ in death as the apocalypse of God's gracious defeat of sin. As God once handed humanity over to sin, God has now handed over the Son, Jesus Christ, for sin's defeat, unquote. No wonder, then, that the call for apocalyptic Pauline preaching and liturgy is often a call for a more provocative preaching and celebration of the cross. So Larry Jones and Paul Sumney write, quote, we may want to throw out the blood hymns out of the hymnal and to keep our crosses golden and pretty, but apocalyptic thought forces us to see even on the heavenly Lamb of God the marks of slaughter, unquote. The result is, as Becca realized, the preaching of a cruciform life, a life dedicated to living out the marks of crucifixion in our own daily experience. The Christian way becomes the way of suffering and sacrifice. What does that do for a community of people for whom suffering and sacrifice has been a state from which they have desperately sought escape? Here my own African-American lens comes back into play the work that I've done on slave spirituals and slave narratives and the crying out of release from suffering and sacrifice. How does it play to a slave community to hear that the way of your life is the way God wants all of life to be and therefore your life to continually be? How do we get there to that point? We get there through forensics. Having failed to make forensics work with the law, we are trying our best now to make it work with the cross. De Boer's analysis of the cosmological and forensic categories is useful. In the cosmological category, the created world has come under the dominion of evil powers. God will invade the present world and defeat those powers. The only questions are when and by what means. But in the forensic category, cosmological forces are absent. The emphasis is instead on free will and individual human decision and the sin of disobedience against God that develops as a result. Death is a punishment for this fundamental sin. God provides the law as a remedy. The key conflict is imaged in terms of a courtroom rather than a battlefield. According to DeBoer, like the Dead Sea Scrolls, Paul's letters employ both the cosmological and the forensic patterns. He appeals to forensics in the Adam story, but he's also very cosmological. And in the end, DeBoer believes that Paul trends to the cosmological. 
Thus, he says, quote, while such passages as chapter 8, verse 1, and chapters 8, verses 33 through 34 indicate that forensic categories have hardly been given up or left behind, the structure and progression of Paul's argument in Romans 1 through 8 suggests that the motifs proper to cosmological apocalyptic eschatology circumscribe and to a large extent overtake forensic motifs, unquote. What he's saying is that Paul at the end is working cosmologically and has moved away from the forensic concept. This cosmological trending begs a provocative question. What really is the key apocalyptic weapon in God's invasive arsenal? De Boer concludes that it is the cross even though on the surface it appears that the cross is an explicitly forensic maneuver. After all, the notion of the cross, at least on the surface, appears to be one of justice satisfaction and not contested territory invasion. Listen to Douglas Campbell. He writes, quote, The Father graciously sends the Son to accept the despairing individual's deserved punishment through his death on the cross. The demands of justice from the cosmic ruler for the punishment of wrongdoing have thereby been met, as that punishment has rather cunningly been redirected. And this, of course, is the origin of the model's theology of atonement, unquote. Campbell is concerned about several logic flaws in this forensic approach to the cross. His principal concern seems to be that there is something unjust about such a transfer of punishment. And in any case, how is it that one person could pay for the wages of sin for all of humankind? Here, the church is often turned to the theory of Anselm, who argued that because an offering of unlimited value was needed, to atone for such an enormous amassing of sins, only the death of God could provide sufficient compensation for the sins of the world. God incarnate must therefore die. In this way, sin could be properly accounted for, forensically speaking, and sacrifice moves its way up to the top of our theological understanding. Now, de Boer chased at this schematization precisely because he thinks it's too forensic. Yes, Paul does, he says, include this version of God's actions in the cross, but only because of his context and the imagined Roman Christians who naturally understand the cross as a forensic category. The Romans use the cross as a courtroom implement or a courtroom tool, who also, these Roman Christians, cannot separate themselves from the perspectives of forensic Jewish apocalyptic eschatology. He writes, quote, For such Christians, presumably, Christ's death would have been understood as a sacrifice atoning for past sins. This sacrificial death did not, though, put an end to law observance, but quite the contrary, obligated those so forgiven to obey it all the more, unquote. In other words, what he's saying is, the more you use the language of the cross as a place where one atones for past sins, the more you have to obey the law in order for the cross to continue to work in this forensic kind of category so that you're compelled to keep trying to obey the law which Paul has already explained doesn't work. But if sin atonement is not Paul's point, what is it? De Boer argues that cross language should be interpreted cosmologically instead. Quote, the meaning of faith is actually determined by the cosmological apocalyptic disclosure of God's righteousness and of sin in the crucifixion of Christ. Christ's death cannot be understood in exclusively forensic terms since it marks God's triumphant invasion of the world under sin to liberate human beings, the ungodly, from sin's deadly power, unquote. The cross as liberating invasion clearly seems to be Paul's understanding at Galatians 1.4. That's what De Boer is saying. The question is, though, how logically does Paul get there? I don't think he can unless he gets to the cross by way of resurrection. In fact, one must read Galatians 1.4 through the lens of Paul's opening statement in Galatians 1.1 where Jesus' introductory tone-setting description is the one whom God raised from the dead. Indeed, this raising is not only how Paul gets into his letter to the Galatians, it's how he gets into both Christ and the Christian tradition. He moves by way of the apocalypse of the risen Christ. Everything, literally and figuratively, starts for Paul with the resurrection. Resurrection is the apocalyptic revelation that Christ first uncovers and then uses to transform the way the apostle understands everything in his world. It is not the crucified Christ who starts him on his way. It is the risen Christ who points him back geographically toward the apostles 
and temporally back to the cross. He may not speak a great deal of the resurrection in Galatians, but one is hard-pressed to understand how he gets to Galatians without having gone through the resurrected Christ. Paul rightly says that he preached nothing but Christ crucified. I'm starting to wonder if one might paraphrase him to say that he preached nothing but the resurrected Christ who had been crucified. Paul needs the resurrection to make his formula work. In the logic of his cosmological construction, I want to make the case that crucifixion is not an invasive act. In an era ruled by death, killing someone seems more an act of collusion and surrender rather than opposition. It remains difficult to comprehend how subjecting Jesus to type A death interferes with the strategic design of the power of sin and death, countering invasion which seemed to occur at just the point when, having been killed, Jesus is raised up. It is in this almost magical, certainly miraculous escape from death, and thereby escape from the rules of death that govern this reality and give the kind of sense to this reality that allows sin and death to maintain their control, that Christ reveals the impotence of death, both in its A and B types. And that seems to be precisely what Paul is himself getting at in 1 Corinthians 15. It is also what George Nickelberg believes is on Paul's mind when he connects faith and salvation to Christ's resurrection in Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Quote, citing the primitive Christian acclamation, Jesus is Lord, and the creedal formula, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, Paul interprets Jesus' resurrection as his exaltation to the status of Lord, and he identifies Jesus' resurrection and exaltation as the event that provides salvation to those who confess and believe in them. Noteworthy in this conditional sentence is the absence of any reference to the salvific character of Jesus' death as an article of faith that leads to salvation. One's faith is placed in the resurrection which rescues Jesus from death. Unquote. Now, why is this discussion so important for the contemporary church and our contemporary preaching to it? I've already spoken about the fact that there are many communities for whom suffering and sacrifice is not seen as a positive. Becker cautions that we must always, when interpreting the cross, do so in a larger apocalyptic context in which the cross functions. He writes, a focus on the cross alone distorts the relationship between the cross and resurrection. The death and resurrection must always be seen as dialectical. Becker also believes that it must, must be seen consecutively, and I would agree, but I would switch the progression. The cross must be encountered, I think, as Paul encountered it through the resurrection. Otherwise, it is, as we learn from the apostles who followed Jesus around Galilee and Judea, incomprehensible. I think there's a reason why they don't understand anything about what he says about his dying on a cross until he's been raised from the dead. Becker captures the end result of this progression rather well. Let me quote him one more time. A theology of the cross, then, that is unrelated to the resurrection as the first fruits of the kingdom of God and of the future resurrection of the dead encourages not only an individualistic distortion of Paul's gospel, but also an exclusivistic centering of that gospel on the Christ, Christ event. And so it can chart our future as human beings only in terms of our individual obedience to the cross and of a cruciform life. It is nothing to say about the future of the world or our future communal solidarity in the kingdom of God. The future resurrection of the dead now becomes transposed into a doctrine of post-mortem afterlife for the individual believer. Unquote. But is that not exactly where our centuries of teaching and preaching have brought our mainstream churches? to a doctrine of post-mortem afterlife for the individual believer, where everything is about us. What of our funeral sermons with their preoccupation with a life well lived on earth and now well situated in many ways because of that earthly good living in heaven? Death is made palatable in the Christian framework because we believe and we preach that we can individually rise above it and we take comfort that those we have lost individually have indeed risen beyond it, and further that we may one day in our own individual resurrection get to be with them again. 
The best collective image we can muster is couples and families reunited in God's presence, a family of loved ones together for all eternity. Though for some dysfunctional families, that might seem like the perfect presentation of hell. <laughs> for most of us, for most it is the individualized, personalized, post-mortem dream. It is this individualized disfiguring of resurrection that, at least in Christian circles, makes death livable. The counter to such a myopic proclamation of the faith is Paul's presentation of the crucified Christ's resurrection as the invasion of an occupied world. An invasion that is not all about me and my future faith relationship or our, my secular standing in the world, but rather the breaking free of this entire world and cosmos from the grip of powers hostile to us and God. Yes, that means something for me individually, but it means something first and foremost for our world. Operating from such a resurrection focus, we are commissioned to retrain our homiletical sites away from individual believers and their particular idiosyncrasies, sinful and not, and take full aim at calling our people to participate in God's ongoing invasion, reclamation, and transformation of our world. Our goal, we should preach, is not to die and get to heaven, our loved ones trailing hopefully in our wake. Our goal, we must preach, is to live into the war raging all around us, siding with God's forceful engagement against the powers that overwhelm this world in its desperate age, even if, and perhaps especially when, the casualty count for believers rises high. This is what it means, it seems to me, to live out resurrection in a world and a church preoccupied with crucifixion. It is the resurrection of Christ, then, I am arguing, that is the turning point in the cosmological war. It is the resurrection that reveals God's intent for humankind and the cosmos. It is the resurrection that is God's single soul act. The cross, well, I think that's on us. We are the ones who drag him there, hang him there, and kill him there. God is the one, the only one, who raises him up from there. And in the process, God sends a potent proleptic message and creates a clear circumstance. So de Boer, quote, the resurrection of Christ from the dead is, in short, as Albert Schweitzer correctly perceived, a cosmic world event, one that marks the turn of the ages, unquote. God's past invasive act of Jesus' resurrection disorients the powers of this age and their rule and sets the stage for God's final culminating resurrection of the dead, which will disempower sin and death completely. It is the resurrection that marks something phenomenally new. And it's the thing Paul has to convince the Corinthians is still out there. The resurrection then is the apocalypse, the, res the revelation of God's intent for the cosmos. The cross is apocalyptic because of the resurrection. The resurrection by its very nature stands as apocalyptic on its own. How can we know? The answer lies at the end of time with the general resurrection of the dead that is prefigured in Christ's own resurrection. The general resurrection will not require the cross. The resulting revelation is this. God's intent is not to consign us to death. God's intent is to break us in all creation, the cosmos, free from death forever. That intent is signaled not when humans kill Jesus, but when God resurrects Jesus. God anti-ups in Christ's resurrection. This is the first apocalyptic bid that shatters the grip sin and death have over this entire historical era and the cosmos that inhabits it. God plays a final apocalyptic hand at the parousia, the second coming when all the chips are down, when sin and death are all in, and so is God when the exalted Christ returns to this cosmological realm. I think this is what Paul means to say at 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every power and every authority for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. The clear presentation of the end is meant to help us more appropriately understand our present. As DuPont notes, a true apocalypse does not have to do with a neurotic obsession to calculate the end of time, but rather it is a perception of the world in light of the knowledge of its end.
Between the ante of Christ's resurrection and the final call up of all the dead at Christ's parousia lies the apocalyptic beachhead on which we currently exist. Christ's resurrection shatters the enslaving power that sin and death presently hold over us. The apocalyptic determinism that fates us to such perpetual bondage is broken. Just as in Adam's act of disobedience all humankind died, so in Christ's invasive resurrection all are made alive. What does this being alive in the era of the living dead mean? Resurrection injects life into this historical era and into the future equation. Resurrection is the vaccine, the antitoxin to the poison of death. Life first quarantines Jesus in his resurrection and ultimately kills in the general resurrection the viral infection of sin that makes us the living dead. So yes, after Jesus' resurrection, prior to the general resurrection, we remain the living dead, but with options. As Gaventa puts it, those who are in Christ still die and still experience pain and are capable of sin. And yet something new has occurred. Apocalyptic vulnerability to God. To understand what has happened, let me appeal to Pauline anthropology. Who are we? What are we? The metaphor I'm using because of its contemporary currency is the living dead. Paul calls it the flesh. So Romans 7, 14b, but I am of the flesh sold into slavery under sin. R. E. O. White clarifies that, quote, Paul never like the Greeks identified sinful flesh with the physical body. For Paul, flesh is a moral concept rather than a material one, a psychological force rather than a physical substance, unquote. In other words, Paul is not opposing the good spiritual with the evil material. In fact, Paul has a very high appraisal of the physical body. The body is dignified by the incarnation, and Paul uses the physical body to image the body of Christ, the church. The body is sanctified as the temple of the indwelling spirit. It can be yielded to God so its members can become instruments of righteousness, and it is destined to be raised incorruptible. Flesh is the person in his or her totality that is, prior to Christ's resurrection, enslaved to the powers of sin and death, and following his resurrection, freed from that enslavement. Flesh, then, is not inherently evil. It is more the concept of physical personality. As such, it is our earthly existence. It is to be viewed neutrally. But it is in the flesh that sin finds its opportunity. Sin uses the flesh, the humanness of each of us, as its point of attack. Romans 7.25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh I am a slave to the law of sin, unquote. Because of God's invasive act that is the resurrection of Christ from the dead, there is emancipation. The resulting proclamation is that we are no longer, to use Leander Keck's re-imaging, prisoners of war to sin. And yet we remain vulnerable to its seductive, mesmerizing power. So Paul can declare at Romans 7, 15, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. The human person liberated from the clutch of sin for some reason will often still choose the way of sin. This is so because while the cosmic condition on the apocalyptic battlefield has been shifted, we remain what we are, the living dead. But living dead whose enslavement to the power of sin and death has been shattered. So while we are still stumbling and bumbling across the cosmic landscape of this historical era, knocking each other around and knocking nature down, we do so freely. We no longer have to obey sin and death. But sin and death are still out there. Where before they could rely on ownership, they now must resort to persuasion. They must convince the living dead to lumber their way for their causes. Constitutionally, deadness remains who and what we are. This deadness sinks with the forces unleashed by sin and death and pulls us back to death even as we seek life. We remain open to sin and death because even after Christ's resurrection, we remain the living dead. Still, with the new condition comes new opportunity even for us. Though flesh remains open to sin, because of Christ's resurrection through the presence of the Holy Spirit, flesh is now also open to the call of God. In the wake of Christ's resurrection, God's Holy Spirit, a surprise combatant, 
invades the apocalyptic battlefield and outflanks the forces of sin and death. The whole human person, flesh, deadness, is suddenly as vulnerable to God as it is to sin. So Paul can say, not I, but the sin that dwells in me, but also not I, but Christ who dwells in me. The living, dead, fleshly person who is imprisoned under sin can also be called to redemption precisely because his or her person is suddenly as accessible to God. Where there was once only imprisonment to sin and death, now there is both vulnerability to sin and death and vulnerability to God. The cosmic war in this way finds its way inside us. We have become the battlefield. Does it preach? <laughs> it does if we do not shy away from finding a contemporary homiletical metaphor that reveals the truth that ours is a world occupied by imperial supernatural powers, that though we cannot see them, they are nonetheless real. This is not some outrageous, the devil made me do it, silly, secularized theology, but an acknowledgement that behind the corporate and individual evil that stalks our world lie forces beyond human control. It is not that individuals are possessed. It is that the cosmos is possessed, infiltrated, overwhelmed, taken captive. We live under the shadow of that captivity still. While the ability of sin and death to enslave was broken in Christ's resurrection and their very existence will be shattered with the coming of the general resurrection of the dead. Today they fight on seeking to attract through artifice and deception what they have lost the ability to do by fiat, hold humankind powerless in their grasp. In the resurrection, God changed something about the world by annihilating the grip of those powers and reconfiguring the human constitution so that it is as receptive to God as it once was singularly receptive to sin and death. Our proclamation is this, the rising of a single dead man did all of that. The rising of every dead person at that one man's coming again will confirm and eternalize that. Our task is to preach this siege mentality in a secular world that believes all evils have human causes and can therefore be rectified through human progress and reason. What better way to do that than through the symbolism of the walking dead, beings whose freedom has been captured by the pathogen of powers unseen, but who now, through the interdiction of God's resurrection vaccine, though still living dead, are vulnerable to the creative, generative, reconciling pull of life. Yes, there is suffering in this scenario, but not suffering, crucifixion or otherwise, caused by God. It is instead suffering that happens when those who act out of their vulnerability to God stand and face the consuming cannibalism of those who continue to devour our world and each other because of a determined loyalty to war powers who no longer imprison us and whom we must no longer serve. Caught up behind enemy lines, we remember God's individual past invasion and anticipate God's corporate invasion in the future by staging invasive maneuvers of our own. If, as Paul claims in 1 Corinthians 15, a follower not trusting in the invasive revelation behind the general resurrection of the dead is no true believer, then a church not acting invasively in this world of the living dead cannot be a true church. The apocalyptic preacher's goal, then, is not only to preach an invasion, but to trigger an invasion. The apocalyptic preacher's aim must be to convince her hearers that we believe that we can participate meaningfully in that invasion because we have been made vulnerable to God's power and linked to the movement of God's spirit. We children of God's past and future invasion must be provoked into restaging that invasion in the here and now. We must because our world, occupied by and preoccupied with death, destroys itself even as we speak. And so Nancy Duff in her article on apocalyptic ethics rightly concludes, 
quote, although we must be alert to the dangers of enthusiasm, we nevertheless live now in that new space created by the powerful invasion of Christ. Living within that new space, we can no longer tolerate old age distinctions in the social and political order which oppress and destroy. We refuse to allow the political order which has foundations in the old age to operate under the slogan business as usual because we do not recognize its legitimacy in God's world. It is in that new space created in Christ that the church is called into being and action. Unquote. In other words, the present time is the time for us, the living dead, to rise to the moment and the apocalyptic meaning of resurrection. Thank you.